EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and these are the best cards from March of the Machine for the Commander format, in my opinion. Not my favorite set ever for the Commander format. It was okay. There was a few things they were doing that I'm not a big fan of. I'm not going to get too negative in this video, though. I'm mostly going to be talking about the cards that I actually like. Again, I try to concentrate on the cards that I think are going to see a lot of play because they're more open-ended. There certainly is a bunch of cards from this set that will be fantastic in certain archetypes but I try not to be too archetype specific when I make these lists I try to lean more towards the stuff that could go in almost any deck so first of all I'm going to start out with an honorable mention just because I think this is a really fun card in a commander game dance with calamity seven in a red so eight mana that's a lot sorcery shuffle your library as many times as you choose you may exile the top card of your library if the total mana value of the cards exile this way is 13 or less you may cast any number of spells from among those cards without paying their mana cost so of course that means if the mana cost is above 13 you don't get to do anything you just paid eight mana to shuffle your library and exile a bunch of cards from it i suppose another interesting aspect of this card is as many times as you choose you can exile the top card of your library which means you can use it to exile your entire library if you want to obviously there are upsides to doing that but if you actually actually want to use this card as it's intended which of course is casting a bunch of stuff for free I just think it's really fun and interesting of course can't stack your library here you got to shuffle it first and then as this resolves I'm going to start revealing stuff from the top of my library and it's almost like playing a game of blackjack where I want to get more value out of what I'm doing but I don't want to go over 13 so I got to be careful with how deep I go it certainly is a gamble I just love it it's a very red card I think it's a fun card and a commander game and I hope it sees some play all right starting out at number 10 is a battle that's right I'm going to start out with a battle and I haven't talked about battles really on my channel at all yet and I'm going to touch on it briefly here of course it's a new card type and I'll just say right out of the gate I don't love the idea of a new card type in the game of magic that whole concept entirely I don't love I don't think it's needed I think it'll cause a lot of confusion particularly with this of course we got a whole bunch of battles from this this set there's a few things I don't love about them one of the things I don't love about them is the fact that they printed them sideways like this I'm not sure why they did that I guess just to be different I don't particularly love it they could have just very easily printed this card the same way they print every other card but nevertheless they decided to go the sideways route one of the things that I think might cause some serious complications here is that this is a permanent that you control that you are then attacking that I think might cause some issues with certain interactions of cards that have a of course been printed throughout the history of the game it's just a weird interaction right having a permanent on the battlefield that you are attacking and your opponent is protecting there is some potential for some very weird interactions there I think going forward only time will tell with these sort of things I know when they first came out with planeswalkers it was a long time before they ironed out all the wrinkles with the interactions with planeswalkers I think we might see some of that here as well but it's hard to judge these things right this is a new permanent type it's kind of hard to judge these things on their face when you first see them and you haven't actually seen them in action so I'm going to reserve most of my judgments here and I'm going to actually talk about one that I think is pretty good and again there's a whole bunch that are archetype specific and certainly can easily slot into a lot of other decks invasion of Segovia is one that I picked out because I think it's just a great card all around and you could put it in pretty much any deck and it's going to be great for you so two and a blue battle siege and of course as it enters the battlefield you choose an opponent to protect it you and others can can attack it when it's defeated exile it and then cast it transformed and of course it has that number four which I believe is the defense of the card I think it's called just like with planeswalkers you want to reduce that number to zero in order to defeat it and then when you defeat it you're going to transform it and when you transform it you're actually casting it which is kind of weird I'm not sure why they worded it that way nevertheless you are actually casting it that can be significant when it enters the battlefield though you create two one one blue kraken creature tokens with trample again kind of weird that we're giving one one tokens trample maybe that's just for flavor but a three mana card that comes down gives you two one one creatures is pretty darn good not too shabby but of course I want to defeat it so that I can transform it and when I do I think the backside's really good it turns into a creature in fact a legendary creature serpent Cadus Sea Tyrant of Segovia non-creature spells you cast have convoke 
That's pretty fantastic, right? Obviously, there's a huge Convoke theme in this set, but even if you're not touching any of that at all, just having all your non-creature spells have Convoke is fantastic. Just tapping down creatures that you have in play to help cast your non-creature spells is great. And also, at the beginning of your end step, untap up to four target creatures. That's also a fantastic ability that can be usable in any deck and obviously plays into the first ability, right? So I can do a whole bunch of attacking and other things on my turn, and then on my end step, untap a bunch of creatures so that maybe I can use them to cast those non-creature spells on other opponents' turns. You know, those non-creature spells, a lot of them are going to be at instant speed. This card can very easily slot into a lot of blue decks, I think. Particularly those control decks are going to want it a lot. I think it's a great card. You could put it in pretty much any blue deck and it's going to be doing a lot of work for you. All right, moving on to number nine, Realm Breaker, the Invasion Tree. Three mana, legendary artifact. Pay two, tap, target opponent mails three cards. Put a land card from their graveyard onto the battlefield tapped under your control it gains if this land would leave the battlefield exile it instead of putting it anywhere else and also has pay 10 mana and tap sacrifice realm breaker the invasion tree search your library for any number of praetor cards put them onto the battlefield then shuffle so i had gone back and forth a little bit whether or not i would actually put this on my top 10 list or whether i would talk about it in a later video which i will be talking about more cards from this set in a later video and i decided yeah i think Think this card is good enough that it certainly is going to see play in a lot of decks not necessarily for that last ability certainly there is going to be a lot of people out there that are going to want to throw that commander deck together that is doing praetor tribal and they can put this in there and they can pay the 10 and go put 15 praetors into play or however many and probably close out the game pretty quick after that i really like that first ability though and i think this card could end up seeing a lot of play just for that alone two mana target opponent mills three cards okay obviously you're milling those cards because you're hoping to get a land into the graveyard but of course this is put a land card from their graveyard onto the battlefield tapped under your control does not have to be a land that you just milled you can just see an opponent who has a fetch land in their graveyard that they used earlier in the game and say okay i want to go get that fetch land i'll target them maybe they'll mill more lands or maybe you can just grab the fetch land that they already had in there it's very likely that you are going to have opponents that have lands in their graveyard already so this card essentially is pay two mana put a land onto the battlefield tap that's pretty good right the fact that that land when it leaves the battlefield gets exiled i really don't see as much of a downside again i guess if it's one of those fetch lands then you don't get to reuse it again so what i think it's very likely that if you had this in play every single turn you could pay the two mana and go get a land out of one of your opponent's graveyards and put it directly into play tapped under your control so just as a ramp option i think this is a pretty good one and again this isn't basic land so you could get some real bombs here and then possibly later in the game when you got a whole bunch of mana lying around maybe you have a couple of praetors in your deck that you can sacrifice this and go get it right you don't have to be doing praetor tribal here maybe i just got one or two they're all really powerful so sacrificing this to go put a couple into play could totally be worth it i think this is definitely going to see some play in the format coming in at number eight is stormclaw rager one black and a red ogre warrior two two pay one sacrifice another creature artifact put a plus one plus one counter on stormclaw rager and draw a card activate only as a sorcery so this is the only card that i would say is really archetype specific on this list also the only multicolored card on this list although it's not really archetype specific obviously you're if you're in any of those racto sacrifice decks which of course there's an absolute ton this is a fantastic fit because it's a great sack outlet you get to put the counter on your stormclaw ravager and then also draw a card also fits with any deck that wants to be sacrificing artifacts as well and of course there's a bunch of those but really i think you could put this in almost any deck at many points during the game i'm sure you're going to have a creature sitting around that you don't really need that you can sacrifice to draw a card or an artifact maybe a mana rock that's been sitting around since the start of the game that you don't really need anymore sacrifice it put a counter on this guy draw a card that seems like pretty good value later in a game i can just start getting rid of all that stuff lying around that i don't really need maybe i'm making a bunch of treasure tokens and I don't really need them anymore because I got lots of mana. I can start sacking them to put counters on this guy, making him bigger, drawing cards. I really like it as a value play, although it obviously does fit in a whole lot of decks that are doing this already. 
Coming in at number seven, Terror of Tawashi. Two black, black, Phyrexian Ogre, four, three with Death Touch. Whenever Terror of Tawashi attacks, you may pay three and a black. When you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. It's a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. So this is just a creature that is repeatedly recurring stuff from your graveyard. Seems pretty good. Being able to four mana get something out of my graveyard, and the next turn four mana get something out of my graveyard. Obviously, this can die in combat. It has Death Touch. If I'm attacking with this, I pay four mana, get a creature out of my graveyard. My opponent chooses to block it. They lose their creature because my guy has death touch. I'm okay with that trade off. You know, even if I just get one use out of this and then also kill my opponent's creature, that seems pretty good. I know a lot of people will see this ability and think, oh, well, it's very mana intensive. Sure, but don't forget, we actually have a creature that we're attacking with here, right? There is an upside to attacking other than this ability, right? We're getting in for damage. So if I attack with this, get in for four damage and then also I can pay four to recur a creature that seems pretty good to me again this is a card that obviously can fit in any of those decks where you want to be getting creatures out of your graveyard but you could also just throw this in any deck because it's always a good thing to be getting creatures out of your graveyard so I think this is definitely going to see some play in the format coming in at number six another interesting card that I think for sure is going to see play in the format schema thief three and a blue the delkin rogue artificer three three with flying when schema thief deals combat damage to a player create a token that's a copy of target artifact that player controls obviously a really interesting ability obviously one that can be used in every commander game there is never going to be a situation where you don't have an opponent with an artifact on the table i don't think unless by some chance someone had just cast a bane of progress or something that's really the only time that's ever going to happen you are creating token copies of stuff that can be significant there actually is commanders that want you to be creating token copies of artifacts so it's obviously going to slot into that deck i can just make a token copy of my opponent's soul ring if i want to that seems pretty good again we're in that situation where i'm attacking with a creature anyway you already want to be doing that it's got flying it's going to be tough to block I'm getting in for three damage and then on top of that i get to copy one of my opponent's artifacts it's a card that you can very easily slot into a whole lot of decks and it's going to be giving you great value in a commander game coming in at number five sunfall and of course almost every single time i make one of these lists now i am putting a white board wipe on that list white has so many fantastic board wipes at this point i don't know i might have to stop putting the white board wipes on these lists because i don't even know if we can craft the top five for mono white board wipes in the format but this one might maybe three white white sorcery exile all creatures so i'm paying five mana to exile all creatures, that's pretty good. There isn't actually any board wipes that do specifically that. The best comparison might be Hollowed Burial, which is a pretty underrated board wipe in the format. Again, we got so many great ones, that one gets buried for sure. That one tucks on the bottom of library, which can be good. Exiling, of course, is probably better because it's likely they will never get them back. But on top of that, we get to incubate X as well, where X is the number of creatures exiled this way. That's pretty darn good. Good. So this is a situation where the more creatures I hit, the better this gets. Obviously, the more creatures you hit, the more value you're going to get off your board wipe. I always want to cast a board wipe and hit at least four creatures. So I'm going to incubate four where four is the number of creatures exiled this way. So of course, that means I'm going to create an incubator token with four plus one plus one counters on it that I can pay two and transform it into a Phyrexian artifact creature. So I essentially end up having the only creature on board, which can be really good. And of course, you can exile 12 creatures with this and get an even bigger creature again very comparable to phyrixian rebirth which interestingly enough they reprinted in this set because it's also making a phyrixian artifact creature very similar of course this is just destroying all creatures although you're getting the token that you don't have to transform sunfall does cost one less and it is exiling so just having to pay the two mana to flip your creature over not a big deal also can be an advantage right don't forget that it's not a creature so it's not going to be hit by any other board wipes and you can flip it over when it's convenient for you i think this is a pretty good board wipe in the format for sure coming in at number four tribute to the world tree green 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 enchantment whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control draw a card if its power is three or greater otherwise put two plus one plus one counters on it so this card is just a strict upgrade to elemental bond i would say although i guess the three green limits you a little bit so maybe it's not going to go in like 
a three color deck, maybe four or five, maybe not so much, but I certainly would put this in almost every single green deck. I mean, you're going to get a benefit no matter what creature comes into play. When your creature enters the battlefield, if it's power three or greater, you get to draw a card. Of course, it's fantastic. If it's just a little guy, you're going to put two plus one plus one counters on it. That's amazing in a whole lot of decks, right? A lot of people will look at this card and go, hey, well, this is going to be great in any deck where I'm playing creatures power three or greater. Well, no, I think it's also great in a deck where you're putting a whole bunch of one one tokens into play think about it i play an avenger of zendikar all those plant tokens that i am making are of course are old ones those are creatures entering the battlefield that don't have a power three or greater so they're all getting two plus one plus one counters on them so now my avenger of zendikar is creating a whole bunch of two three creatures that of course can get bigger as they go that seems pretty good so i think this card is a slam dunk in a decks where you are playing the elemental bond type of cards anyway but it's also a pretty good card in a deck where you're just shooting out a bunch of token creatures as well this card fits in a whole lot of decks the only thing holding it back there is that three green Coming in at number three, and I think in the top three here, we're getting to the stuff that is definitely going to see a whole lot of play in the format. Fire Main Commando, three and a white angel soldier, four, three with flying. Whenever you attack with two or more creatures, draw a card. Pretty great card draw option for white. Again, almost every single time I make a top 10 video for a set now, I'm talking about another great white card draw option. This seems like a pretty good one. Obviously, a lot of white decks are in the attacky theme. This isn't difficult to do. Fire Main Commando includes its Self, so I attack with my fireman commando and just one other creature I get to draw a card but on top of that whenever another player attacks with two or more creatures they draw a card if none of those creatures attacked you that part makes this card really really interesting now some people might not want to play this card because it allows your opponents to draw cards but at the same time it has that very white effect of deterring your opponents from attacking you right you want this on the table because of course if your opponent is attacking someone else with two or more creatures Creatures, they get to draw a card not only is this enticing your opponents to attack each other it's enticing them to do so with two or more creatures they just can't attack with one creature and get the card draw here they have to attack with at least two creatures so they're probably going to be getting in for a decent amount of damage maybe there's going to be some creatures trading in combat and they're going to lose some creatures all of that is plus side for you the fact that they get the card draw kind of nice for them i guess but at the same time i think it's more upside for you also the politics aspect works really nicely in a commander game as well i think this is a really fun interesting card draw option for mono white in the commander format coming in at number two is another card that is just very easily going to slot into maybe almost every red deck in the commander format pain distributor two and a red devil citizen two three with menace whenever a player casts their first spell each turn they create a treasure token well that's a very huggy effect for a red card right however whenever an artifact an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield pain distributor deals one damage to that player i love cards like this in a commander game and as you will see from the top three cards the top three cards all fit the same theme of they are cards that are kind of helping your opponents kind of but at the same time not really they're almost in that false hug strategy like sure you get a treasure token but when you sacrifice it you're going to lose a life and of course when we cast our first spell each turn we're going to get the treasure token but we get to sacrifice it without losing any life so this is benefiting us and then of course any other artifacts that your opponents have that are going to the graveyard are going to lose them life as well treasure token strategies are incredibly popular in the format right now and of course just any card at all that is producing treasure tokens is going to be pretty popular in the format and this is really going to punish a lot of those decks i like it for that reason but i also like it for the reason that it is sort of that card that when people see they're not going to be sad to see it right i love cards like this in a commander game and you might even get into the situation where one opponent opponent tries to remove it and the other opponent wants to protect it because they want it to stick around i love cards like this in a commander game it really creates an interesting sort of political situation when you have it on the table but even more in that sort of scenario is fairy mastermind i think this is probably my favorite card from this set and this one interestingly enough wasn't printed in the commander precon although it feels like a very commandery card to me 
One in a blue, Fairy Rogue 2-1 has Flash and has Flying. Whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, you draw a card. Now, of course, it also has this ability, pay three in a blue, each player draws a card. That's pretty good. Again, you have that sort of huggy effect that you are more going to take advantage of. Whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, you draw a card. So if you activate that ability on an opponent's turn after their draw step, of course, now you're going to get an extra draw. Everyone gets to draw a card, you're going to get to draw two. That is obviously the intention of the way this card is supposed to be used. But again, we're in this situation where you have a card that wants your opponents to be drawing cards so that then you can get a benefit off of it. And of course, a comparisons can be made to Consecrated Sphinx a little bit, but Consecrated Sphinx is sort of the super powerful busted version of this, whereas Fairy Mastermind is the more fair version or downplayed version of Consecrated Sphinx that I don't think is going to be a removal magnet that your opponents aren't going to really care about that much. Of course, this card should be a guaranteed one-time draw at the very least, right? Two mana, two one with flash and flying that draws you a card when an ETBs is fantastic. And of course, we can make sure that happens because we wait until our opponent is about to draw their second card each turn and then we flash it in. And then of course, there's the dream scenario where our opponent casts a wheel we flash this in, everyone discards and draws, and now we get to draw a card for every single opponent because they've all drawn more than two cards this turn. Remember, this is whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn, so if all your opponents are drawing a whole bunch of cards all at once, you're going to get a trigger from this from all of them. I really like this card in a commander game. Again, it fits the situation of my opponent's drawing, that's okay, at least I get a benefit off of it as well. I love cards like that in a commander game. And then again, you have that sort of political huggy aspect of it that can fit nicely into a lot of decks as well. Really great design, I think. Probably my favorite card from this set. That is it. That is all my top 10 cards from March of the Machine for the Commander format. I will be making another video covering a whole bunch of other cards that for me are sort of like, yeah, they'll see play. Maybe they're more archetype specific or maybe they're sort of on the fence. There certainly is a lot to talk about from this set. What are your guys' favorite cards from from March of the Machine that I did not mention in this video, let me know in the comments below. And if you are thinking of purchasing any cards that I mentioned in this video, I do have a TCG player link in the description below. Give it a click, it helps support the channel. But that is it for today, and thanks for tuning in.